Another edition of Grok Talk, brought to you by New Hampshire's leading conservative blog site, GraniteGrok.com. We are your feared extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for more news and opinion you could only get from GraniteGrok.com. Grok Talk. Our apologies to our podcast listeners. The first five and a half minutes of Kimberly's interview on the Balsams and SB30 was lost due to technical difficulty. We resume the discussion already in progress. We found out from the Business Finance Authority that the $28 million is really only going towards $73 million. So what's happening is they are splitting up the resort part where they'll update the resort, et cetera, and the timeshare part. So the only part that the taxpayers will be, and quote, unquote, invested in is the resort part. And I think part of it might, and I don't know if this is true, but part of it might have to do with the, you know, taxes can now be assessed in this area. So if they build this, then they can, they could look to the, uh, shareholders in the timeshares if this was to fail. So I think Les Otten is, is splitting these up intentionally so that if it does fail, we're, then we can't go to the timeshare holders to try to get our money back. I just want to apologize quickly to our uh, stream listeners on uh, speaker. We had a major um, crap out and I lost the stream for a bit but it is back up so I, you know this is nuts Kimberly and thank you for doing all this research by the way because I know that people are interested in the fine details and uh, you know we want to make sure we have them mm-hmm. so yeah, this is um, I gotta kill this thing <laughs> well listen, listen let me tell you something they asked in the, I give the committee credit they were asking really good questions so to me I was like oh wow I, you know, I just figured it was going to get shoved through, like, the potato bill. Um, I just figured it was going to get shoved through. And, but when they started asking all these really good questions, I was kind of surprised. But then when I got up there and I started telling about the bad things about Balsam, you know, and they kind of tried to shut me up, then I knew, you know, it's not necessarily a good thing. Um, but so so than, they want to know how much trouble they're in, but they're still willing to step in and help anyway. Well, yeah, they don't they don't seem to care and it was funny because they were talking about the value during the hearing they talked about the value of the land and everything. And Otten said, Well, there's there's over eight thousand acres and he brought up the timber survey and how much that was worth, which I brought up, no one's brought up before. And it's funny, he didn't bring up the five thousand of acres that were purchased by a conservation organization for eight hundred and fifty grand a few years ago. That land if it's still owned by that conservation organization, cannot be counted in the value of the balsam. It is. They never give it back. You, what do you mean? The con- conservation organizations, once they acquire land, they yes, never yes. give it back. Exactly. And and, and so, so that's 5,000 acres. That's 3.5 to $5 million worth of timber that they can't count in the valuation of the balsams, but they were, including on. So that was another thing I, I brought up, and it was funny because I heard someone on the committee, so my, so someone on the right that was sitting in the committee said, that's right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so let's yeah. hope that, you know, the committee was a little bit informed. Um, but, you know, because no one else had brought that up. Uh, after three hours of testimony, no one else brought that up. You cannot consider that in the value of the balsams, and the balsam certainly isn't worth $28 million right now. No, um, and, and that's exactly how these conservation groups work. They they uh, come up with a, a voluntary agreement to take certain areas off the table for, for future yep. development, and they pay you something towards it but not the full value, and it's supposed to be a partnership, but once you're in, you can't get out. Yeah, that's it. You're, you're done. So, you know, the other interesting thing, was that uh, someone asked, a committee member asked uh, and if he had a plan B. So basically they said, you know, if SB30 doesn't pass, what is your plan B? And Otten uh, actually said, 
plan B is plan A. Jeez. <laughs> oh, so in, I- other words, in other words, he pulled over Rupa Salt and said, well, plan B is plan A. I don't have any other plans. If you don't pass this, I'm just not going to build it. You know something? That's the kind of despicable actions. It's like, I'm going to take my ball and go home. And so why are the Republicans letting themselves be held hostage to this? Why not just let the place fall into bankruptcy and sell it off and see if anybody will actually invest? Okay, well, here's the other thing, guys. Ah and lied. Uh, well, he might not have known. I shouldn't say that. Um, during the testimony, they said he said, well, no one else wanted to buy this, and that is a lie. Because, and again, I don't know if he might not have known this, but the current owners certainly know this. There was someone else who wanted to buy the ball from beforehand, and they wanted to spend $10 million and upgrade it and make it continue as a resort. They didn't want to put all these ski slopes in and, and all these uh, timeshares and this big, you know, uh, conference facility. They wanted to kind of make it back to what it was, you know, only obviously upgraded and and nice, so people would want to go up there. But <laughs> so it, this whole thing, as I've said before, is all based on shenanigans, um, backroom deals. Who knows all the, the backroom deals that have really gone on? But the thing is, they're trying to say that SB30 isn't actually about the balsams. But again, it wouldn't have come up if he didn't have his hand out. And why does he ha- have his hand out when he has? Almost all of the money, over $100 million to actually, he could actually work on the project, right? He could, and he said during the hearing, he said, well, one of the reasons it's hard to get private investors is because, you know, if you're not open and running, people don't see if, if it's successful or not. Well, why aren't you up, upgrading it, renovating the actual resort, running it, and then other investors will come in? I mean, he's using his own logic against, against him. Because what he's saying is he can't he can't start this project until the state backs up twenty eight million dollars for him because it's a bond that will be the state will allow him to get. And yet he has a history of basically, as they say in the restaurant trade, chew and screw. Um, for American Ski Corporation or company that he used to own, he left that company four hundred million dollars in debt. He resigned as a CEO. Probably he was pushed out because he – I was just reading a book about him or part of it with the Red Sox because, you know, he talks most about the Red Sox. He really had a, a really way far back, you know, get in the back of the bus kind of role in the Red Sox because he didn't have the financing. And Jack Henry didn't like him. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Sorry. I bought that book just so I could look up. The information about Ah, and I'm not even kidding you. I'll probably <laughs> never read it, but someone told me about it, so I looked it up. And thank, thank you for tablets because I can just do a search and find it rather than trying to go through the whole book paper paper book. <laughs> but, <laughs> no kidding. I was just uh, I was just remarking about that the other day about how you can just I love my Nook because I can just search any phrase or word or whatever and find everything. Uh, we're gonna take a really really short break. Can really stay on the line, and we'll okay. be back in about a minute. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused, and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. I am singing the blues. I got to tell you, the techn- technological difficulties we're having today are enormous. So um, I've had problems with my recording stream. I have problems with my uh, live stream. I have problems with my Jazzler. 
you Single box. We've had problems with you stream. Camera. Camera. <laughs> Cords. So uh, well, the final version of this program could be interesting. There could be some gaps. Uh, we'd like to apologize for that because crap happens. But anyway, speaking of crap happens, we have the Balsams bailout. So, uh, and that's why Kimberly Morin has joined us to continue this discussion. If you guys can hear me, you'll have to unmute yourself. I just turned your microphone back on. Yeah, so and I just turned think, his microphone back on. Thinking of stuff that happens, um, did anybody bring up the toxic dump section of the property in the hearings? You there, Kimberly? Oh, here we go. I, oh, now I can hear you. Are oh, you there? Oh, yeah. He asked if uh, anybody brought up the toxic dump rumors. Yes. Okay. Kevin Bloom did. Yes. Okay. Kevin Blue, he testified like one one person before me, um, and yeah, he did bring it up, and that's that's something that sort of just kind of disappeared and quietly went away, <laughs> you know, because um, I looked into that, and then all of a sudden the activity on it being in the news ended, and that doesn't mean that the toxic weight jump ended. It just means you know our our swell investigative reporters that are in the mainstream media didn't bother reporting on it, which, oh, my gosh, that's just so not possible. Well, right? you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a standard rule in quality management that if you don't write it down, it doesn't exist. So uh, this applies also to the media and apparently to latex-related toxic waste dumps at the balsams. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Liquid, I, I forget what I saw when I was doing the research because this, this project is so bad. That's why I call it the Balsam's Boondoggle because it's so convoluted. And I even said that during my testimony. I'm like, I hadn't even heard of SB30. Someone asked me to look into it, from North Country, by the way. And I started looking into it, and I was like, oh, my God. Seriously. And it just gets worse and worse. And why they why they pulled Les Otten into it is beyond me, other than the fact that the guy probably promised them the world and is only going to hand them a freaking outhouse. Question. But, Question for you, Kimberly. You know, certainly um, Senator Woodburn, who is a, sten- a senator from a state senator from up north. Obviously, the north is really poor economically, and they're just scrambling to find any kinds of jobs. Is he looking at this, and has he been pushing it politically because he sees it as probably the only lifeline that's come their way in any amount of time? Oh yeah, he's he. He was one of the first one. I think he was the first one who testified at the hearing. Um, yeah, and that's a lot of what was being said. Oh, the North Country, there's no jobs, there's no this or that. Well, you know, the two current owners of the Balsams actually fired 300 people who were working there a few years ago because they wanted to close it down to renovate, except these yahoos never got any investors before they bought it for a low, dirt cheap price of $2.3 million, given that the timber survey ahead of time was worth 3.5 to $5 million alone. Just the timber by itself was alone all, uh, worth almost $5 million before the two local guys, Hebert and DeGas, or whatever his name is, DeGrasse, they bought it. And they didn't have any investors because they didn't have any plans, in my opinion, to actually upgrade it. You don't buy something without getting investors to back you up with millions of dollars to do an upgrade. It seems to me that they were they wanted to flip it. They figured they'd buy it for cheap because that's what they got it for, and then sell it really quick. You know, sell it rather shortly afterwards to some other investor. But it didn't quite work out that way. And these guys are now working with Otten, so it's like the Three Stooges of North Country trying to freaking. <laughs> <laughs> Try to, sorry, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I saw, I listened to Otten, and it, it was funny. It was he was sitting behind me when I was giving my test? When I could hear him making noises because he didn't like what I was saying. The man reeks of arrogance, and you know what I found out is um, I don't know if it was Maine or New Hampshire, but they used to have because he was so bad with just buying all these ski resorts, and rather than focusing on you know, doing what he said and promised them the ski resorts he had bought. He just kept buying them more because he wanted to be the king of snow country. They had bumper stickers that said, more snow, less Otten. <laughs> <laughs> because people in Vermont and New Hampshire, I mean, in New Hampshire and Maine, didn't like this guy. At first they did because he was doing, you know, all this good stuff, but then he just kept, he got in over himself. It's like the emperor wears no clothes. You know what I mean? 
He um, could uh, he could start his own reality TV show. Flip this boondoggle. Oh, he really he he could, and and people would hate his guts. Um, just because of the he, he he walks into the room and you can he reeks of arrogance, and that's that's not a good thing. Um, because he doesn't care. He was actually asked during the hearing, <clears throat> "Will you promise to only hire people from New Hampshire or up in that area?" And he said, "No." <laughs> Oh, that's a good way to make your case with local politicians, isn't it? Yeah. Um, basically, and you know, I kind of get it. His excuse was, well, I don't know if I can only hire local people. What if there's not enough? Blah, 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 blah. But he can't even make that promise. But he wants us to hand over $28 million. You know, um, and we already know that the two own- people that own it now tried to get that foreign EB-5 program going, and it failed. So we already know they were going to bring in foreign workers um, to try to work on the Baltimore project as opposed to local residents. And you know what really kills me is this is basically the legislature saying to the taxpayers, we want to take $28 million, hand it over to a wealthy white guy so he can create low-paying jobs for basically servants to, to serve his wealthy clientele. Can we start calling this the uh, New Hampshire uh, Solyndra Project? It's worse than that. It's even worse than that, in my opinion, because you have all these poor people up in um, Co-op County who are like, yes, we need to do this. And one guy actually got out. I don't know if it was a rep or not. I can't remember. He's like, our young people are leaving. We need this so they'll stay. What young person is going to stay so they can be a servant to rich white people? (laughs) (laughs) I hadn't thought about it that way. I mean, seriously, most of these jobs are going to be low-paying jobs. It's going to be chambermaids, um, waitresses, servers. Most of the the construction jobs are going to be brought in, so... But that's that, that's the huge thing, right? Most of it because they don't. I mean, I'm sure they just don't even have enough people up there to do the construction jobs. Never mind um, filling all of them, you know. Um, but yeah, so they're all they're all like this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Really, you 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 want your kid's future to be this? No, your the young people are still going to leave. Well, any young person who gets a taste of life outside of our country is not going back, or not until they're older. And I'm not. I'm not insulting North Like they, people. unless they like the smell of balsam. Well, the thing is, I'm not. I'm not insulting North Country because I love it up there. We were married up there. It's beautiful up there. But guess what? I don't live there because there's no freaking job. It's, you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, empty space. Yeah, I mean, basically up there, you you've got farming, maybe a little mining. I timber. don't know. You've got timber. And you've got people who work from home if the if the internet's fast enough. And uh, and and, well, and, the and the internet's and not even fast enough. Tourism. So that's it. Yeah, tourism. So you know, you, yeah. you you either got to figure out how to exploit it or it's a retirement area. Right. Exactly. And and that's the thing is that that's what they said. They're like hospitality is our future. Okay, I can I can get that because you know New Hampshire is a huge uh, tourism state. But if you really think that getting young people to stay here is, is by putting this in, that's wrong. And they're not, I guarantee they probably wouldn't even be able to fill all of the jobs. Supposedly, they want eventually by 2024 or whatever, they have 1,500 jobs. Well, honestly, who is going to work those jobs? You know, I, I just, I, I almost feel sorry for the people who are all hell bent on this because it's like that. That's your lot in life to do that. Well, you'd think you know there's, uh, nobody's going to commute thing. that far because it's not worth it. So, so the only people that will do those jobs are not New Hampshireites because they'll go somewhere else and take their college educations for a real income, which leaves you with more Mexicans. Right, right. They'll be shipping in um, seasonal workers. They'll French be Canadians. like a lot of hotels do. A lot of places do that. They ship in. My God, years ago, I, I spent. Years going up to Hampton Beach when I was a kid, there was always, they used to ship in Irish, the Irish or Canadians. <laughs> the uh, apple orchards bring in Jamaicans. Believe really? it or not. Oh, yeah. To pick apples. They come up, they pick apples all summer, and then they go home. Well, I know that there's a local farm that brings in, uh, local up for me, brings in uh, people from Eastern Europe on uh, work visas. Some of them stay longer, obviously. 
Yeah. Um, most go back, but some stick around, and uh, you know that that's what happens. And not the local kids like it used to be. No, exactly. When like when we were kids, it was it, we would do those jobs, um, but kids are going off to college now, and they they want more. You know, they don't. It's not the same today as it was twenty or thirty years ago, where you just stay in your town and you and you work whatever jobs are there. People want more. Yeah, I bet and, you that Les Otten is also urging that uh, Congress give. President Obama's fast track a, a trade authority because buried it just came to light this week. It just uh, it's another backdoor immigration because basically it's going to open up immigration of workers across borders just like they did in the EU. So except it will be dealing with people from you know across the Pacific. So no longer will they have to hide in the the uh, the holds of the storage. Uh, of the um, cargo right. ships. He'll just ca- come on in the next 747 again to compete. We will become a borderless society if Congress, especially the Republicans, give Obama this uh, ability. Yay for the American worker. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, you know, we don't we don't matter anymore. Don't you know that? Uh, it's um, rapidly getting to that point. Yeah, it pretty much is. Um, you know, it's funny. Like I said, the... Um, I was interrupted, and they said, are you going to talk about the bill? And I found a quote (laughs) from the New Hampshire Department of Resources and Economic Development, and the quote says, the passage of SB 30 is vital to saving the balsams and transforming it into a world-class resort. If it does not pass, there may never be another chance for the this landmark, and the opportunities it brings will be relegated to history. So, in other words, if SB 30 doesn't pass, this project isn't going to go forward. What does that say to you about Otten and the, the current owners now? doesn't say anything good. No, it doesn't. They could already be working on this. They have over $100 million in financing. They could already be working on this. They could already be providing jobs. But they're standing there like petulant children waiting for $28 million from the state. And I still have to figure out really why. All right, Kimberly, we got to go. Thank you so much. You have a great weekend. Bye, guys. All right. See ya. Take Uh, care. All right. We'll be right back with Dave Bozell, not Brent. We'll be right back. This is Grok Talk.